Who does? So, go ahead and uh, get a snack. Feel free to get up as you need to and get a snack. Just quietly and do so. Yeah, okay, these two. Oh, oh. Oh, here. I was fortunate to have grown up during a time that it was cool to be Italian American. Probably not so for our grandparents, but it was for us. Uh, we had baseball stars like Joe DiMaggio and Yogi Berra, boxers Rocky Marciano and Nino Benvenuti, singers Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and many others. There were cool Italian actors, fashions, cars, motorcycles, and the fact that we had an incredible Italian-American family um, just added to my pride in being Italian growing up. Despite a strong desire to learn Italian and explore Italy, I wasn't able to begin fulfilling this dream until I was in my 40s. But I've done all I can since then to make up for that late start. In 2001, I took my wife Lucy and daughters Susie and Lindsay to live in Italy for a year. It was an unforgettable and enriching experience. That story is covered in my book, An American Family in Italy, Living La Dolce Vita Without Permission. Uh, this book is for sale on Amazon in ebook or print version, and I also have a few print copies for sale uh, here. If you want to talk to Lucy, my wife afterwards, my lovely wife who's assisting with moving the slides here. And there's Susie too. There she is on the left up there. Uh, <clears throat> the cost is $10 for the print version. In 2011, I retired from teaching and Lucy and I started living in Italy for three months a year at the Casolari dei Fiori. Then in 2015, we bought a home in Monte Carlo, the last city of residence of Michele Spironi and Anita Segheri before they came to America. Since then, I've spent days, weeks, maybe months in the state and church archives looking up historical records. I wanted to find our family tree but I also wanted to know what life was like for our ancestors. Where do our ancestors come from? Well, Annette went over that a little bit. Our grandparents may have said um, Montecatini because that's the nearest big city. Um, or Lucca, sometimes people said Lucca um, because that city is just off to the left there. But more accurately, we can say they came from the Val di Nievole, the valley of the Nievole River, which is shown here. This area here it includes uh, Pescia, Montecatini, Bugiano, Ponte Buginese, Chiesina Utsinese, San Salvatore, Monte Carlo, this valley area. The Segheri family can be traced um, to Monte Carlo as early as the 1200s, but the rural area where they had their farmland was actually between three smaller towns, San Salvatore, Chiesina Utsuneste, and Marginone. Okay, here's Monte Carlo, the actual hilltop city. This is a fraction of Monte Carlo, San Salvatore. Chiesina Utsuneste and Marginone. The Segheri family from the 1200s at least had property right in this area right in here. What is near your mouth? Right in that area right there. <laughs> so sometimes Segheri said they were from San Salvatore, sometimes they said they were from Marginone, sometimes from Chiesina. Um, it did fall under the jurisdiction of Monte Carlo too. So that was the city seat. So more often they would say Monte Carlo. The Spironi family instead centered a few um, miles to the east. Our Spironi ancestors can be traced through a series of small settlements as they moved. Marliana, which is off the map, but would be in the north and a little bit uh, over to the right there, um, off the map. 
and uh, then they moved to Stignano, and then Ponte Buginese, then Pesce, and finally San Salvatore, the suburb of Monte Carlo. So, a little more history now. Let's begin our history lesson uh, as early as we can. We'll make it very brief. Tuscany was the center of the Etruscan civilization. And no doubt we all have some drops of Etruscan blood in our veins. In fact, the name Toscana, Tuscany, is derived from the Etruski, the Etruscan people. Monte Carlo is located between important Etruscan settlements that have been discovered in Lucca and Firenze. In fact, if you look at that map and you see the word Etruscans there, that's right about where Monte Carlo is. <clears throat> Much of the culture and uh, discoveries that we think of now as having been passed on to us from the Romans actually first came from the Etruscans. Many of the, their reliefs and paintings depict them drinking wine and having family parties, a tradition that still permeates Italian culture in modern times. Their influence on Roman society has only come to be appreciated in the last century. The Etruscans drained marshes, built underground sewers, and created roads and bridges using arches. They promoted trade, the development of metallurgy, and better agriculture in and around Rome. They introduced the Greek alphabet, and so respected was their knowledge that Roman nobles would send their sons to be educated in Etruscan schools. In fact, the first Roman kings were Etruscans. You may also be interested to know that the Christian images of the devil with pointed ears, a tail, and a pitchfork are modeled after Etruscan demons. The Etruscans were absorbed into Roman society, and in recent years we've learned <coughs> that Lucca was a key Roman city. There was a ritzy Roman house uh, uncovered there in 2010. One of those things where they start digging to remodel their house and they find out that there's a Roman ruin underneath it. And it's now been learned that this was the site of the first triumvirate, a crucial meeting between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus that ended the Roman Republic while setting the stage for Caesar, Julius Caesar, to become Roman Emperor. The home is now a museum, open to the public for informative tours. If you're lucky, you might even get to meet Caesar himself. <laughs> Roman rule was replaced by Gothic rule, and then came the Longobards, also called the Lombards, for whom Lombardia in Italy is now named. We think the first Sigari in Tuscany may have been so named during the reign of the Longobards. Sergio Nelli is a renowned historian and author who works at the State Archives in Lucca. He lives in Monte Carlo, is our neighbor there, and has written books about the town's history and its founding families. And it is he who has traced the Sigari line back to the 1200s. He believes the name derives from two German words, Sieg and either Heri or Herr. Sieg means victory. You might have heard that in uh, Hitler's Sieg Heil, victory. Heri, or Herr in modern German, means lord, or Heer means army. So the name could either mean victorious lord or victorious army. Which, either one is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, by the way, does anybody know the meaning of Spadoni? Do you all know that? <laughs> Spada is sword. And Italians just change the ending to make a word big or small, or plural. So, spada sword, spadone is a sword singular, broad sword. Spadoni is plural. And by the way, spadino or spadini, which sometimes my friends call me. They didn't know that, but that would mean little sword. So, it was truly an insult when they wanted to say that. They just didn't know it. Anyhow, we have pretty much two other really cool names. Uh, why, the, back to the Sigari, why would an Italian have a name of a Germanic origin? Well, because the Longobards were originally Nordic, but they moved down and settled in Germany before coming south to reign in Italy, and so they spoke an old German language. The first Sigari could have been a Longobard, or he could have been indigenous to Tuscany, and he received his surname from the Longobards. 
As a sidebar, I've seen the names of the wives of our family lines <clears throat> on both the Sigeri and Spironi sides. They all have names common to the region. I, names I, you still see on city streets all over the place, and I see in the archives. Some of you have had uh, DNA tests from Ancestry.com, which is a pet peeve of mine. It currently doesn't seem to recognize Tuscan DNA as strongly Italian. Uh, people from Sicily come out as nearly 100% Italian, while Tuscans come out a mix of Italian, French, maybe German. Now it makes sense that um, Tuscans and Sicilians have different DNA, but to label one as fully Italian and the other as partially Italian doesn't make sense to me. And I strongly believe this is a mistake on the part of Ancestry, and one that maybe they'll be corrected in the future as they do more DNA testing. Even if the first Sigiri was a Longobard ruler, by now his DNA would be minimal compared to the indigenous Tuscan DNA our family would have acquired by more than a century of living in the same place. So I value the evidence of the genealogical research more than the, the uh, DNA ethnicity labeling at this time. All right, off my soapbox on that. Um, in the 12th and 13th centuries, it was still common to use Latinized names and a list of important citizens in Pisa shows a half dozen with the name Sigarius, which in the years following has been um, italicized or changed to the Italian of Sigari. So we have that evidence in, as back as early as the 12th and 13th centuries that there were Sigaris in our area of Tuscany. In Monte Carlo, the spelling <coughs> is used an E after the S, where in Pisa it is more often an I but Tuscan historians say it is the same family line. There uh, are a few other variations less common but believed to be the same origin. Sicari and Sevieri also have, are common in that area. It's an unusual name found only in that area of Tuscany, um, though of course in modern times Sigaris have moved in various places in the world, but I can say that if you have Sigari in your bloodline, uh, you are somehow tied with someone else with Sigiri in their bloodline because it is the name of singular origin. Okay, back to the timeline. Uh, timeline? Uh, I put up here June to Sigiri, born around 1250 in Vivanaya. And the significance of that is that he is our earliest known ancestor, traced from generation to generation by Dr. Nelly, using first civic records, then going back farther with church records, and then going back even farther before the church records existed and looking at contracts that were recorded in the city of Vivanaya, later Monte Carlo. There was a famous philosopher <coughs> uh, cited in Dante's Paradise. I have no idea if we have a relation there, but I do know we have a definite paper trail to Junta. Brief sidebar on <clears throat> doing Italian genealogy. Italy, Italy only became a nation in 1861, so there's not very many records available before that. Beyond that, you go back to church records. They kept very good records in the churches. <coughs> Starting in the late 1500s, pretty much everybody uh, was married in the church, had their children baptized, even if they weren't devout Catholics, they, they did record their uh, birth. So we can get records back to about the 1600s, a little earlier. Beyond that, you have to go to <coughs> contracts that were recorded in the city. And I have no access to that, but Dr. Nelly, who's the historian from Monte Carlo, helped us get the Sigari line back into the 1200s by looking at contracts that were recorded between Junta Sigari and his descendants, and it would give the name, and it doesn't say their age or their place of birth, but you can tell who their name are, and it gives the names of their father and grandfather. Okay, meanwhile, let's get back to the Spidonis here with the timeline. We pick up the first recorded Spidoni ancestor in Marliana, a few miles uh, northeast of the Val di Nievole. He must have been born around 1430, and his son Francesco moved a few miles west to Stignano in the late 1400s. There Francesco had two sons, Michele and Bartolomeo. And from them, all the hundreds of Spironis living in the Val di Nievole have their origins. I can't tell you if other Spironi families in Italy are related, but I can say that any Spidoni living in the Val di Nievole today and throughout the previous centuries is almost certainly a descendant of Francesco Spidoni. 
right around the time of the birth of our 16th great-grandfather, Junta, in 1250, Europe underwent some particularly difficult and turbulent centuries. Warfare between Lucca, Firenze, and Pisa was either in full force or at least a constant threat. And Monte Carlo was on the border between Lucca and Firenze. So sometimes it was right in the midst of the battles. The early 1300s were particularly turbulent. In 1413, Pisa ruled Lucca, and pretty much whoever ruled Lucca ruled Monte Carlo. Then Lucca, under the leadership of Castruccio Castracani, threw off the Pisans, but was attacked by the Florentines. Castracani successfully held off Firenze in the Battle of Alto Pascio, which he directed from the hill of Vivanaia in 1325. But six years later, Firenze destroyed the main settlement of Vivanaia. Bavarian Prince Carlo IV became the new ruler, lending his support for the expansion of the fortress and building new city walls. In gratitude, the people of Vivanaia named the renewed city Monte Carlo, the Mountain of Charles. Those who survived the warfare had even more fearsome foes to face. The Little Ice Age started in the 1300s and continued for more than 400 years. The peak years were in the late 1600s, during a period of weak solar activity called the Maunder Minimum. Italian researchers reported in a 2012 study, extreme cold with snow occurred in 16 of 25 winters between 1675 and 1700, and rivers on the Italian peninsula froze. The Venetian lagoon froze over at least two of those years. A priest in France wrote, the cold began on January 6th, the crops that had been sown were all completely destroyed. Most of the hens had died of cold, added the beasts in the stables. When any poultry did survive the cold, their combs were seen to freeze and fall off. Many birds, ducks, partridges, woodcock, and blackbirds died and were found on the roads and on the thick ice and frequent snow. Oaks, ashes, and other valley trees split with cold. Two-thirds of the vines died. No grape harvest was gathered at all. I myself did not get enough wine from my vineyard to fill a nutshell. 1347 was also a bad year for weather. Six months of almost continuous rain ruined the crops and created massive floods that caused a breakdown in communications and transport. Food shortages ensued, bringing soaring prices and famine. But all this was nothing compared to what happened in January of 1348. Sailors from Geneva returning from the east stopped in Pisa to drop off cargo and a lot more, the Black Death. <clears throat> 500 people died each day in Pisa and it spread from there to Lucca and Firenze, which were among the hardest hit cities in all of Europe. Monte Carlo is only 22 miles from Pisa and about 10 miles from Lucca. Florentine writer Giovanni Boccaccio described the plague as it ravaged his city in 1348. The symptoms were not the same as in the East, where a gush of blood from the nose was the plain sign of inevitable death, but it began both in men and women with certain swellings in the groin and under the armpit. They grew to the size of a small apple or an egg, more or less, and were vulgarly called tumors. In a short space of time, these tumors spread all over the body. Most people died within about three days. The violence of this disease was such that the sick communicated it to the healthy who came near them, just as a fire catches anything dry or oily near it. And it even went further. To speak or to go near the sick brought infection and a common death to the living. And moreover, to touch the clothing or anything else the sick had touched or worn gave the disease to the person touching. In this suffering and misery of our city, the authority of human and divine laws almost disappeared. For like other men, the ministers and the executors of the law were all dead, or sick, or shut up with their families, so that no duties were carried out. Every man was therefore able to do as he pleased. One citizen avoided another. Hardly any neighbor troubled about others. Relatives never or hardly visited each other. Moreover, such terror was struck into the hearts of men and women by this calamity, that brother abandoned brother, and the uncle his nephew, and the sister his, her brother, and very often the wife her husband. What is even worse and nearly incredible is that fathers and mothers refuse to see and tend their children as if they had not been theirs. The plight of the lower and most of the middle classes was even more pitiful to behold. Most of them remained in their houses, either through poverty or in hopes of safety, and fell sick by thousands. 
Since they received no care and attention, almost all of them died. Many ended their lives in the streets, both, <clears throat> both at night and during the day, and many others who died in their houses were only known to be dead because their neighbors smelled their decaying bodies. Dead bodies filled every corner. Most of them were treated in the same manner by the survivors, who were more concerned to get rid of their rotting bodies than moved by charity towards the dead. It's rather morbid, but something that our ancestors had to live through. The plague abated a few years later, but it returned periodically with nearly equal force for the next 400 years. The 1500s and 1600s also had numerous years of pestilence. In 1548, Cosimo de' Medici ordered dams built to stop the outflow from the swamps in the southern Val di Nievole, turning the marshy ground into a lake that buried forests and farmland and prompted frequent epidemics of malaria commencing in 1550. Bujano, Stignano, and Monte Carlo were particularly hard hit in 1554 and 1557, but malaria outbreaks continued well into the 1800s. The bubonic plague returned to claim more lives throughout the centuries. In 1631, Stignano and Bujano instituted a quarantine prohibiting commercial activities with Lucca and other cities in an attempt to keep the plague away, but it had only moderate success. Parish priest Francesco Pellegrini wrote in 1631, In Pesce, certainly more than 2,000 people have died, and in Massa, so many have died that now there are no more than 300 souls remaining, big and small, and maybe fewer in this, this community of Bujano, and it is the same in Stignano. Now we can only imagine what this felt like for our ancestors, who obviously were among the survivors. However, we do know one story, a little more modern, that gives us just a little peek at the drama of an epidemic. Seguero Segeri, Anita's brother, who went by the name of Jim in America, joined the army at the end of World War I. About 53,000 soldiers died in battle, but Uncle Jim was not threatened by enemy soldiers. He was instead declared dead from the Spanish flu, which killed almost as many soldiers as those who died in combat. The medics didn't have beds <coughs> for all the dying men, and believing Jim to be dead, they ordered his body carried out with the other corpses. This probably saved his life because the cool night air lowered his temperature, and the next day, he woke up. His fever had broken, and he recovered. Who knows <coughs> how many stories there may be of other ancestors who similarly survived epidemics throughout the ages. It was right after the last outbreak of the plague that people began moving from Stignano to Ponte Buginese in Bujano. The Medici dams in the valley were broken open, exposing rich farmland that had previously been covered. Our ancestor, Leonardo Spadoni, moved his family to the lowlands in 1635, and other Spadoni families did the same. The last Spadoni family moved out of Stignano in 1767. I throw the Spadoni Tower into the timeline, even though I don't know its connection with our branch of the family. It's located in a rural marshland about four miles from Lucca, and was built around the 1500s. Now this is when Francesco Spadoni was living in Stignano, so we didn't have any direct connection to it. And indeed, I don't know the connection to it. Uh, it was likely built by another branch of the family and was used as a watchtower to guard against enemies coming from Pisa or Firenze. When the morning sun hits it, Lucy and I can actually see the Torre degli Spadoni, the Tower of Spadoni, from our terrazza, even though it's about 12 miles from our home. When I first heard that there was a Spadoni Tower, the newspaper accounts I found online said it was in a shameful state of disrepair, with crumbling plaster, trees, and weeds growing from it and it had been spray painted by vandals. But as I continued my research, I found that the city of Kapanmari had restored it in 2013, and it looks nearly new now. No one knows much about its history, and it has gone by several different names, Torre degli Spadoni, Torre della, della Spada, Torre del San Donino. Unfortunately, the plaque that was installed after the restoration uses none of those names. It's in an isolated area and has few visitors, and I'm really strongly tempted to install my own plaque that says, historically called the Torre degli Spadoni. Who would, yeah, I mean, who would notice? You know, it might be years before anybody actually noticed them, and they think, yeah, well, the city must have put that up. <laughs> 
Just as the Spadoni Tower derives from a different branch of the same family, in the Sigiri family we also had an important and wealthy branch. They owned most of the family farmland, renting it out to the other branches of the family. Simone Sigieri used his wealth to buy a noble title that was about to go defunct from lack of heirs. He became known as Simone Sigieri Bizzari, and his son and future generation became Knights of Santo Stefano. This was a religious order sponsored by the Medici family for the purpose of safeguarding the Medici trading routes from bandits. The requirements to become a Cavaliere di Santo Stefano were as follows, religious devotion, nobility, wealth, and residence in Pisa. The family moved to Pisa but maintained its land in Monte Carlo. I found a contract between our direct ancestors and the Sigieri Bizzari family in which we rented the land during their absence. It included details such as we had to provide game for their holiday meals in addition to the rent payments. Because they were now noble, the Sigieri Bizzaris also had to have a coat of arms. What would be their symbol? Well, the lion, of course. Many people used that because it represented power. But what would be their specific symbol? Well, where did the name Sigiri come from? They picked a saw. Does anyone know why? Sega. Sega. Sega in Italian means saw. And so um, they didn't have any other sources of information, so they assumed that maybe that's where the name came from. Um, but actually, a sawyer is a segatore. So choosing a saw was probably a mistake. But, you know, they had no Google and uh, no libraries that they could go to, so they did the best they could do at the time. This family contributed a lot to Monte Carlo, and one can still find the Sigieri coat of arms <clears throat> over the door of a large home in Monte Carlo, and also over the most important altar in the main church in Monte Carlo. There was a Sigiri family reunion in Monte Carlo in 2016, and those who attended received ceramic copies of the coat of arms, and this was arranged by Elena Benvenuti, the wife of Davide Sigiri. All right, let's look at some important dates in Spadoni history. Um, Pellegrino Spadoni, an ancestor to all the Spadonis here, was born in 1795 in Ponte Buginese. Uh, they had moved for them there from Stignano about 150 years before that. Uh, then in, uh, Pietro and Angelo Spadoni were born in 1832 and 1834 in Ponte Buginese to Pellegrino. And Pietro married Maria Marchi in Pescia, he moved to Pescia, and then later to Monte Carlo. Angelo marries Clorinda Silvestri and also moves to Monte Carlo. Pietro has eight children, including Michele, uh, my grandfather, and Enrico. Angelo has uh, six children, including one named Pietro Carmignani Spadoni, and he is the no-no of Eileen Ricomi and her brothers, <coughs> and the beast no-no of renowned hairdresser Sauro Spadoni, a friend of Susie's. Uh, and I sh would like to take this time now to introduce you to Eileen and her husband uh, Lambert Lucetto, they're sitting right here. I believe if we had an award for the people who came the longest distance, they have come from Chicago to join our family reunion. Um, so from, uh, where is that? No, keep this up here. Enrico, Michele's brother, is the father of Adolfo and Alfredo. Now I have another chart that's going to be a little easier to understand after this. But <clears throat> these are all the ones who then came to America, um, to Gig Harbor, Tacoma, Seattle, and Chicago. There are quite a few others that I've, uh, Spadonis that I've discovered and I found out how we're related, but it's in a much more distant way. Uh, the, some charts that I put on my blog just a couple days ago will also explain some of this. Okay, let's take a look at the Sigiri timeline too, and I'll add a little bit there. Uh, our early 
early ancestor, Andrea Seguiri, was born in 1818. Um, he, that's not the same Seguiri that came to America. Uh, he has sons Torello, Natale, Agisto, and Luigi. Torello, at some point, moved to either Florence or Luca to study uh, music. He's the great-grandfather to many of us here. And he has the children that Annette showed, Anita, Ruggiero, Seguiro, and Rosina. Whereas Natale um, stayed in Italy, and he's the father to Bruno and Dante. And there's also an Agisto, um, who was the son, uh, right there. And his family moved to California. Uh, when we had our reunion in, I think it was 2012, Donald uh, Segari came, and he's from that line there. Um, Bruno stayed in Italy, and he's our closest relative there. I believe he's a third cousin. Uh, and he's like 93, I think he turned, 92 or 93 this year. Um, and he did have a brother named, uh, no, excuse me, I'm talking about Mario, the son of Bruno. Anyhow, all these names will go out of your head anyhow, so it's not that important to you remember them all. A lot of this is on my charts. Anyhow, um, so Bruno remained in Italy and had eight, there it is, at the very bottom, had eight children. Our, um, one of them is Mario, our closest relatives there. Okay. Um, I want to also tell you a little bit about what life was like for our ancestors um, because that's, you know, you can look back at the history of Italy and it talks about uh, who was in charge, who was the rulers, but that didn't really affect our families. So I wanted to look back on what life was like and I found our early Spadoni ancestors were relatively wealthy, the ones who first moved to Stignano. We can find, deduce this from the fact that they were one of the two families with a tomb beneath the floors of the church in Stignano. But within time, our branch of the family became landless tenant farmers, probably because the eldest son usually inherited the property and the others had to fend for themselves. The Segari family of the 1800s was somewhat better off as they still had their own land, which they probably had purchased from the family's noble line. The noble line has since sold everything and moved away. I did find one member of this branch uh, living still today in France. Nonetheless, the lives of all the farmers in the Val di Nievoli had many similarities throughout the centuries. They probably cared little about rulers and politics and more about survival, weather, and the conditions of their land and farm equipment. Throughout the hardships, warfare, and changes of loyalties between the 1300s and the 1800s, for the farmers in the region, life changed very little. Each family would have kept donkeys, oxen, or cows to help plow the fields, which were planted with wheat, olives, grapes, and fruit trees, biblical products, common food for all peoples of Mediterranean stock. Every family threshed its own wheat with heavy wooden flails, which can still be seen today in some remote Tuscan farms. Likely our ancestors wore the common dress of peasant farmers of the time, a short gray tunic of coarse homespun wool called a bigella. From the writings of Francesco Dettini, a wealthy merchant who lived in the late 1300s in nearby Prato, we can see foods that were common during the area, which are largely the same today. He wrote of eating lasagna, ravioli, minestra, mortadella, eggs, cheese, bread made from finely ground wheat flour, fish, pork, and a wide variety of fowls, both wild and domesticated. Tatini stuffings for ravioli consisted of pounded pork, eggs, cheese, and a little sugar and parsley, after which the ravioli were fried in pork lard and powdered with sugar. It's likely that the ravioli made by the Spironi and Sigari women were simpler though, as they were not as well off as the tini. Olive oil, wild herbs, and nuts were probably used to complement pasta. A typical contadino would have pr produced all the food needed to feed his family. Four or five people could survive on the produce of one ettaro of land, about two and a half acres. Their gardens would have grown a large variety of vegetables, the same as seen in farmers markets today quite a bit of which also grew wild. Then they would have had fruit teas, apples, pears, apricots, peaches, figs. Each year the farmers would plant a few new olive trees and dig several ditches for new vines. Every family had its own chickens, pigs, rabbits, and cows, and they knew how to use every part for food. Extra eggs, milk, vegetables, and fruit would have been sold at the markets in Pesce and Montecatini. While 
Wars and political intrigue often threatened the farmers' more immediate concerns were providing for their families. They meant to establish local laws that would prevent farmers upstream from impeding the waterways, and local committees met regularly to meet out penalties if the cattle of one farmer damaged the fields of another. Fines were doubled if the infraction occurred during the time of harvest. Fines were cut in half if the offending animal was a horse, donkey, or under a year of age. In addition, the animals were restricted, at least in the area around Stignano. Each family could possess 12 sheep, two goats, two pigs, and six oxen, with the obligation to conduct them to the mountains for pasture. Strict laws were also enacted to prevent anyone from cutting herbs or hay in the field of a neighbor. Festivals revolved around the harvest of the most vital of the crops, grains, grapes, and olives in particular. Some integral foods now automatically associated with Italy were unavailable to our early ancestors. They had no tomatoes, corn, or coffee. Coffee was not introduced until the 1600s in Venezia, coming from the east and spreading throughout Italy, and then into the rest of Europe. Tomatoes and corn came to Tuscany in the mid-1500s, imported from South America. Tomatoes soon became the basis, of course, for many Italian meals. In fact, Tuscany was the first region in Italy to cultivate the pomodoro, pomodoro, or golden apple. Tomatoes were initially thought to be poisonous by wealthy Europeans who used flatware made from pewter, which has a high lead content. Foods high in acids, as tomatoes are, would cause the lead to leach out into the food, resulting in lead poisoning and death. But the contadini, who ate off wooden plates, didn't have that problem. Pizza, though, was not invented until the 1880s in Napoli, and it was unknown to many 20th century Italian immigrants from northern and central Italy, including our grandparents and their children, who first tasted pizza in America. When our Spinoni ancestors had to make do without their own land, this meant working as sharecroppers under the mezzadria. Under this system, land was divided into poderi, varying in size from seven or eight to 30 acres, sometimes even more. The landowner, called a padrone, would provide a house, barns, and stables, plow animals and other livestock, presses for oil and winemaking, and carts and other tools. Instead of paying a rent, a peasant farmer, called a contadino or colono, a colonist, would give one half of every crop harvest <coughs> and half of any profit made from the sale of animals, vegetables, eggs, and milk. A manager known as a fattore kept the accounts. Some fattori were said to skillfully manipulate the ledgers to make a profit from both padrone and contadino, as is expressed in this old saying, Fami fattore un anno e se non mi arico mi dano. Make me a fattore for a year and if I don't get rich I'll be damned. This system strongly favored the landowners though because of the abundance